The fairies assembled one moonlit night in a pretty clearing of the ancient forest of Burzi. The clearing was in the form of a circle, and all around stood giant oak and fir trees, while in the center the grass grew green and soft as velvet. If any mortal had ever penetrated so far into the great forest, and could have looked upon the fairy circle by daylight, he might perhaps have seen a tiny path worn in the grass by the feet of the dancing elves. For here, during the full of the moon, the famous fairy band, ruled by good Queen Lulia, loved to dance and make merry while the silvery rays flooded the clearing and caused their gauzy wings to sparkle with every color of the rainbow. On this especial night, however, they were not dancing, for the queen had seated herself upon a little green mound, and while her band clustered about her, she began to address the fairies in a tone of discontent. "'I am tired of dancing, my dears,' said she. "'Every evening, since the moon grew big and round, we have come here to frisk about and laugh and disport ourselves. And although those are good things to keep the heart light, one may grow weary even of merrymaking. So I ask you to suggest some new way to divert both me and yourselves during this night. That is a hard task, answered one pretty sprite, opening and folding her wings slowly, as a lady toys with her fan. We have lived through so many ages that we long ago exhausted everything that might be considered a novelty and of all our recreations nothing gives us such continued pleasure as dancing. "'But I do not care to dance to-night,' replied Lulia, with a little frown. "'We might create something by virtue of our fairy powers,' suggested one who reclined at the feet of the queen. "'Ah, that is just the idea,' exclaimed the dainty Lulia, with brightening countenance. "'Let us create something.' But what? I have heard, remarked another member of the band, of a thinking cap having been made by some fairies in America. And whatever mortal wore this thinking cap was able to conceive the most noble and beautiful thoughts. That was indeed a worthy creation, cried the little queen. What became of the cap? The man who received it was so afraid someone else would get it and be able to think the same exquisite thoughts as himself, that he hid it safely away, so safely that he himself never could think afterward where he had placed it. How unfortunate! But we must not make another thinking cap, lest it meet a like fate. Cannot you suggest something else? I have heard, said another, of certain fairies who created a pair of enchanted boots, which would always carry their mortal wearer away from danger, and never into it. "'What a great boon to those blundering mortals!' cried the queen. "'And whatever became of the boots?' "'They came at last into the possession of a great general who did not know their powers. So he wore them into battle one day, and immediately ran away, followed by all his men.' and the fight was won by the enemy. But did not the general escape danger? Yes, at the expense of his reputation. So he retired to a farm and wore out the boots tramping up and down a country road, and trying to decide why he had suddenly become such a coward. The boots were worn by the wrong man, surely, said the queen, and that is why they proved a curse rather than a blessing. But we want no enchanted boots. Think of something else. Suppose we weave a magic cloak, proposed Espa, a sweet little fairy who had not before spoken. A cloak? Indeed, we might easily weave that, returned the queen. But what sort of magic powers must it possess? Let its wearer have any wish instantly fulfilled, said Espa brightly. But at this there arose quite a murmur of protest on all sides, 
which the queen immediately silenced with a wave of her royal hand. Our sister did not think of the probable consequences of what she suggested, declared Lulia, smiling into the downcast face of little Espa, who seemed to feel rebuked by the disapproval of the others. An instant's reflection would enable her to see that such power would give the cloak's mortal wearer as many privileges as we ourselves possess. And I suppose you intended the magic cloak for a mortal wearer? she inquired. Yes, answered Espa shyly. That was my intention. But the idea is good nevertheless, continued the queen, and I propose we devote this evening to weaving the magic cloak. Only its magic shall give to its wearer the fulfillment of but one wish, and I am quite sure that even that should prove a great boon to the helpless mortals. Suppose more than one person wears the cloak? one of the band said, which then shall have the one wish fulfilled. The queen devoted a moment to thought, and then replied, Each possessor of the magic cloak may have one wish granted, provided the cloak is not stolen from its last wearer. In that case, the magic power will not be exercised on behalf of the thief. But should there not be a limit to the number of the cloak's wearers? asked the fairy lying at the queen's feet. I think not. If used properly, our gift will prove of great value to mortals. And if we find it as misused, we can at any time take back the cloak and revoke its magic power. So now, if we are all agreed upon this novel amusement, let us set to work." At these words the fairies sprang up eagerly, and their queen, smiling upon them, waved her wand toward the center of the clearing. At once a beautiful fairy loom appeared in the space. It was not such a loom as mortals use. It consisted of a large and a small ring of gold, supported by a tall pole of jasper. The entire band danced around it thrice, the fairies carrying in each hand a silver shuttle wound with glossy filaments finer than the finest silk, and the threads on each shuttle appeared a different hue from those of all the other shuttles. At a sign from the queen, they one and all approached the golden loom and fastened an end of thread to its warp. Next moment they were gleefully dancing hither and thither, while the silver shuttles flew swiftly from hand to hand, and the gossamer-like web began to grow upon the loom. Presently the queen herself took part in the sport, and the thread she wove into the fabric was the magical one which was destined to give the cloak its wondrous power. Long and swiftly the fairy band worked beneath the old moon's rays, while their feet tripped gracefully over the grass, and their joyous laughter tinkled like silver bells, and awoke the echoes of the grim forest surrounding them. And at last they paused and threw themselves upon the green with little sighs of content, for the shuttles and loom had vanished. The work was complete, and Queen Lulia stood upon the mound holding in her hand the magic cloak. The garment was as beautiful as it was marvelous. Each and every hue of the rainbow glinted and sparkled from the soft folds, and while it was light in weight as swan's down, its strength was so great that the fabric was well nigh indestructible. The fairy band regarded it with great satisfaction, for every one had assisted in its manufacture and could admire with pardonable pride its glossy folds. "'It is very lovely indeed,' cried little Espa. "'But to whom shall we present it?' The question aroused a dozen suggestions, each fairy seeming to favor a different mortal. Every member of this band, as you doubtless know, was the unseen guardian of some man or woman or child in the great world beyond the forest. And it was but natural that each should wish her own ward have the magic cloak. While they thus disputed, another fairy joined them and pressed to the side of the queen. "'Welcome, Ariel,' said Lulia. "'You are late.' The newcomer was very lovely in appearance 
and with her fluffy golden hair and clear blue eyes was marvelously fair to look upon. In a low, grave voice she answered the queen. Yes, your majesty, I am late, but I could not help it. The old king of Noland, whose guardian I have been since his birth, has passed away this evening, and I could not bear to leave him until the end came. So the old king is dead at last, said the queen thoughtfully. He was a good man, but woefully uninteresting, and he must have wearied you greatly at times, my sweet Ariel. All mortals are, I think, wearisome, returned the fairy with a sigh. And who is the new king of Noland? asked Lulia. There is none, answered Ariel. The old king died without a single relative to succeed to his throne, and his five high counselors were in a great dilemma when I came away. Well, my dear, you may rest and enjoy yourself for a period in order to regain your old lightsome spirits. By and by I will appoint you guardian to some newly born babe, that your duties may be less arduous. But I am sorry you were not with us to-night, for we have had rare sport. See, we have woven a magic cloak. Ariel examined the garment with pleasure. And who is to wear it? she asked. Then again arose the good-natured dispute as to which mortal in all the world should possess the magic cloak. Finally the queen, laughing at the arguments of her band, said to them, Come, let us leave the decision to the man in the moon. He has been watching us with a great deal of amusement, and once, I am sure, I caught him winking at us in quite a roguish way. At this every head was turned toward the moon, and then a man's face, full-bearded and wrinkled, but with a jolly look upon the rough features, appeared sharply defined upon the moon's broad surface. "'So I am to decide another dispute, eh?' said he in a clear voice. "'Well, my dears, what is it this time?' We wish you to say what mortal shall wear the magic cloak which I and the ladies of my court have woven, replied Queen Lulia. Give it to the first unhappy person you meet, said the man in the moon. The happy mortals have no need of magic cloaks. And with this advice the friendly face of the man in the moon faded away until only the outlines remained visible against the silver disk. The queen clapped her hands delightedly. Our man in the moon is very wise, she declared, and we shall follow his suggestion. Go, Ariel, since you are free for a time, and carry the magic cloak to Noland. And the first person you meet who is really unhappy, be it man, woman, or child, shall receive from you the cloak as a gift from our fairy band. Ariel bowed and folded the cloak over her arm. "'Come, my children,' continued Lulia. "'The moon is hiding behind the treetops, and it is time for us to depart.' A moment later the fairies had disappeared, and the clearing wherein they had danced and woven the magic cloak lay shrouded in the deepest gloom. On this same night Great confusion and excitement prevailed among the five high counselors of the kingdom of Noland. The old king was dead, and there was none to succeed him as ruler of the country. He had outlived every one of his relatives, and since the crown had been in this one family for generations, it puzzled the high counselors to decide upon a fitting successor. These five high counselors were very important men. It was said that they ruled the kingdom while the king ruled them, which made it quite easy for the king, and rather difficult for the people. The chief counselor was named Tullydub. He was old and very pompous, and had a great respect for the laws of the land. The next in rank was Tullydub, the Lord High General of the king's army. The third was Tillydib, the Lord High Purse-bearer. The fourth was Tallydab, the Lord High Steward, 
and the fifth and last of the high counselors was Telly Deb, the Lord High Executioner. These five had been careful not to tell the people when the old king had become ill, for they feared being annoyed by many foolish questions. They sat in a big room next the bedchamber of the king in the royal palace of Nole, which is the capital city of Noland, and kept every one out except the king's physician, who was half-blind and wholly dumb, and could not gossip with outsiders had he wanted to. And while the high counselor sat and waited for the king to recover or die, as he might choose, Jicky waited upon them and brought them their meals. Jicky was the king's valet and principal servant. He was as old as any of the five high counselors, but they were all fat, whereas Jicky was wonderfully lean and thin and the councillors were solemn and dignified, whereas Jicky was terribly nervous and very talkative. "'Beg pardon, my masters,' he would say every five minutes, "'but do you think His Majesty will get well?' And then, before any of the high councillors could collect themselves to answer, he continued, "'Beg pardon, but do you think His Majesty will die?' And the next moment he would say, "'Beg pardon, but do you think His Majesty is any better or any worse?' And all this was so annoying to the high counselors that several times one of them took up some object in the room with the intention of hurling it at Jicky's head, but before he could throw it the old servant had nervously turned away and left the room. Tally Deb, the Lord High Executioner, would often sigh, oh, I wish there were some law that would permit me to chop off Jicky's head. But then Tully Dub, the chief counselor, would say gloomily, there is no law but the king's will, and he insists that Jicky be allowed to live. So they were forced to bear with Jicky as best they could. But after the king breathed his last breath, the old servant became more nervous and annoying than ever. Hearing that the king was dead, Jicky made a rush for the door of the bell tower, but tripped over the foot of Tollydob and fell upon the marble floor so violently that his bones rattled and he picked himself up half-dazed by the fall. "'Where are you going?' asked Tollydob. "'To toll the bell for the king's death,' answered Jicky. "'Well, remain here until we give you permission to go,' commanded the Lord High General. "'But the bell ought to be tolled,' said Jicky. "'Be silent,' growled the Lord High Purse-Bearer. We know what ought to be done and what ought not to be done. But this was not strictly true. In fact, the five high counselors did not know what ought to be done under these strange circumstances. If they told the people the king was dead and did not immediately appoint his successor, then the whole population would lose faith in them and fall to fighting and quarreling among themselves as to who should become king, and that would never in the world do. No, it was evident that a new king must be chosen before they told the people that the old king was dead. But whom should they choose for the new king? That was the important question. While they talked of these matters, the ever-active Jicky kept rushing in and saying, Hadn't I better told the bell? No! they would shout in a chorus, and then Jicky would rush out again. So they sat and thought and counseled together during the whole long night, and by morning they were no nearer a solution of the problem than before. At daybreak Jicky stuck his head into the room and said, "'Hadn't I better—' "'No!' they all shouted in a breath. "'Very well,' returned Jicky. "'I was only going to ask if I hadn't better get you some breakfast.' Yes, they cried again in one breath. And shall I toll the bell? No, they screamed, and the Lord High Steward threw an inkstand that hit the door several seconds after Jicky had closed it and disappeared. While they were at breakfast they again discussed their future action in the choice of a king, and finally the chief counselor had a thought that caused him to start so suddenly that he nearly choked. The book, he gasped staring at his brother counselors in a rather wild manner. "'What book?' asked the Lord High General. "'The Book of Laws,' 
answered the chief counselor. I never knew there was such a thing, remarked the Lord High Executioner, looking puzzled. I always thought the king's will was the law. So it was, so it was when we had a king, answered Tully Dub excitedly. But this book of laws was written years ago, and was meant to be used when the king was absent or ill or asleep. For a moment there was silence. Have you ever read the book? then asked Tilly Dib. No, but I will fetch it at once, and we shall see if there is not a law to help us out of our difficulty. So the chief counselor brought the book, a huge old volume that had a musty smell to it, and was locked together with a silver padlock. Then the key had to be found, which was no easy task. But finally the great book of laws lay open upon the table, and all the five periwigs of the five fat counselors were bent over it at once. Long and earnestly they searched the pages, but it was not until afternoon that Tully Dub suddenly placed his broad thumb upon a passage and shouted, I have it! I have it! What is it? Read it! Read it aloud! cried the others. Just then Jicky rushed into the room and asked, Shall I toll the bell? No, they yelled, glaring at him. So Jicky ran out, shaking his head dolefully. Then Tully Dub adjusted his spectacles and leaned over the book, reading aloud the following words. In case the king dies and there is no one to succeed him, the chief counselor of the kingdom shall go at sunrise to the eastward gate of the city of Nole, and count the persons who enter through such gate as soon as it is opened by the guards. And the forty-seventh person that so enters, be it man, woman, or child, rich or poor, humble or noble, shall immediately be proclaimed king or queen, as the case may be and shall rule all the kingdom of Noland for ever after, so long as he or she may live. And if any one in all the kingdom of Nole shall refuse to obey the slightest wish of the new ruler, such person shall at once be put to death. This is the law. Then all the five high counselors heaved a deep sigh of relief, and repeated together the words, this is the law. But it is a strange law, nevertheless, remarked the Lord High Purse-Bearer. I wish I knew who will be the forty-seventh person to enter the East Gate to-morrow at sunrise. We must wait and see, answered the Lord High General, and I will have my army assembled and marshaled at the gateway, that the new ruler of no land may be welcomed in a truly kingly manner as well as to keep the people in order when they learn the strange news. "'Beg pardon,' exclaimed Jicky, looking in at the doorway. Uh, "'But shall I toll the bell?' "'No, you numbskull,' retorted Tully Dub angrily. "'If the bell is tolled, the people will be tolled, and they must not know that the old king is dead until the forty-seventh person enters the east gateway to-morrow morning.' Nearly two days' journey from the city of Nole, yet still within the borders of the great kingdom of Noland, was a little village lying at the edge of a broad river. It consisted of a cluster of houses of the humblest description, for the people of this village were all poor and lived in simple fashion. Yet one house appeared to be somewhat better than the others, for it stood on the river bank and had been built by the ferryman whose business it was to carry all travellers across the river. And as many travelled that way, the ferryman was able in time to erect a very comfortable cottage, and to buy good furniture for it, and to clothe warmly and neatly his two children. One of these children was a little girl named Margaret, who was called Meg by the villagers and Fluff by the ferryman her father, because her hair was so soft and fluffy. Her brother, who was two years younger, was named Timothy. But Margaret had always called him Bud, because she could not say brother more plainly when she first began to talk. 
so nearly everyone who knew Timothy called him Bud, as little Meg did. These children had lost their mother when very young, and the big ferryman had tried to be both mother and father to them, and had reared them very gently and lovingly. They were good children, and were liked by everyone in the village. But one day a terrible misfortune befell them. The ferryman tried to cross the river for a passenger one very stormy night, but he never reached the other shore. When the storm subsided and morning came, they found his body lying on the river bank, and the two children were left alone in the world. The news was carried by travelers to the city of Nole, where the ferryman's only sister lived, and a few days afterward the woman came to the village and took charge of her orphaned niece and nephew. She was not a bad-hearted woman, this Aunt Rivette, but she had worked hard all her life, and had a stern face and a stern voice. She thought the only way to make children behave was to box their ears every now and then. So poor Meg, who had been well-nigh heartbroken at her dear father's loss, had still more occasion for tears after Aunt Rivette came to the village. As for Bud, he was so impudent and ill-mannered to the old lady that she felt obliged to switch him and afterward the boy became surly and silent, and neither wept nor answered his aunt a single word. It hurt Margaret dreadfully to see her little brother whipped, and she soon became so unhappy at the sorrowful circumstances in which she and her brother found themselves that she sobbed from morning till night and knew no comfort. Aunt Rivette, who was a laundress in the city of Nole, decided she would take Meg and Bud back home with her. The boy can carry water for my tubs, and the girl can help me with the ironing, she said. So she sold all the heavier articles of furniture that the cottage contained, as well as the cottage itself, and all the remainder of her dead brother's belongings she loaded upon the back of the little donkey she had ridden on her journey from Nole. It made such a pile of packages that the load seemed bigger than the donkey himself, but he was a strong little animal, and made no complaint of his burden. All this being accomplished, they set out one morning for Nole, Aunt Rivette leading the donkey by the bridle with one hand, and little Bud with the other, while Margaret followed behind, weeping anew at this sad parting with her old home and all she had so long loved. It was a hard journey. The old woman soon became cross and fretful, and scolded the little ones at almost every step. When Bud stumbled, as he often did, for he was unused to walking very far, Aunt Rivette would box his ears or shake him violently by the arm or tell him he was a good-for-nothing little beggar. And Bud would turn upon her with a revengeful look in his big eyes, but say not a word. The woman paid no attention to Meg, who continued to follow the donkey with tearful eyes and drooping head. The first night they obtained shelter at a farmhouse, but in the morning it was found that the boy's feet were so swollen and sore from the long walk of the day before that he could not stand upon them. So Aunt Rivette, scolding fretfully at his weakness, perched Bud upon the bundles atop the donkey's back, and in this way they journeyed the second day, the woman walking ahead and leading the donkey, and Margaret following behind. The laundress had hoped to reach the city of Nole at the close of this day, but the overburdened donkey would not walk very fast, so nightfall found them still a two hours' journey from the city gates, and they were forced to stop at a small inn. But this inn was already overflowing with travelers, and the landlord could give them no beds, nor even a room. "'You can sleep in the stable if you like,' said he. There is plenty of hay to lie down upon." So they were obliged to content themselves with this poor accommodation. The old woman roused them at the first streaks of daybreak the next morning, and while she fastened the packages to the donkey's back, Margaret stood in the stable yard and shivered in the cold morning air. The little girl felt that she had never been more unhappy than at that moment and when she thought of her kind father and the happy home she had once known, her sobs broke out afresh, 
and she leaned against the stable door and wept as if her little heart would break. Suddenly someone touched her arm, and she looked up to see a tall and handsome youth standing before her. It was none other than Ariel the fairy who had assumed this form for her appearance among mortals, and over the youth's arm lay folded the magic cloak that had been woven the evening before in the fairy circle of Burzee. "'Are you very unhappy, my dear?' asked Ariel in kindly tones. "'I am the most unhappy person in all the world,' replied the girl, beginning to sob afresh. Then, said Ariel, I will present you with this magic cloak which has been woven by the fairies. And while you wear it, you may have your first wish granted, and if you give it freely to any other mortal, that person may also have one wish granted. So use the cloak wisely and guard it as a great treasure. Saying this, the fairy messenger spread the folds of the cloak and threw the brilliant-hued garment over the shoulders of the girl. Just then Aunt Rivette led the donkey from the stable, and seeing the beautiful cloak which the child wore, she stopped short and demanded, "'Where did you get that?' "'This stranger gave it to me,' answered Meg, pointing to the youth. "'Take it off, take it off this minute, and give it to me, or I will whip you soundly.' cried the woman. Stop, said Ariel sternly. The cloak belongs to this child alone, and if you dare take it from her, I will punish you severely. What? Punish me? Punish me, you rascally fellow. We'll see about that. We will indeed, returned Ariel more calmly. The cloak is a gift from the fairies, and you dare not anger them for your punishment would be swift and terrible. Now no one feared to provoke the mysterious fairies more than Aunt Rivette, but she suspected the youth was not telling her the truth, so she rushed upon Ariel and struck at him with her upraised cane. But to her amazement the form of the youth vanished quickly into air, and then indeed she knew it was a fairy that had spoken to her. You may keep your cloak, she said to Margaret with a little shiver of fear. I would not touch it for the world. The girl was very proud of her glittering garment, and when Bud was perched upon the donkey's back and the old woman began trudging along the road to the city, Meg followed after her with much lighter steps than before. Presently the sun rose over the horizon and its splendid rays shone upon the cloak and made it glisten gorgeously. "'Ah, me!' sighed the little girl half aloud. "'I wish I could be happy again.' Then her childish heart gave a bound of delight, and she laughed aloud, and brushed from her eyes the last tear she was destined to shed for many a day. For though she spoke thoughtlessly, the magic cloak quickly granted to its first wearer the fulfillment of her wish. Aunt Rivette turned upon her in surprise. "'What's the matter with you?' she asked suspiciously, for she had not heard the girl laugh since her father's death. "'Why, the sun is shining,' answered Meg, laughing again, "'and the air is sweet and fresh, and the trees are green and beautiful. The whole world is very pleasant and delightful. And then she danced lightly upon the dusty road and broke into a verse of a pretty song she had learned at her father's knee. The old woman scowled and trudged on again. Bud looked down at his merry sister and grinned from pure sympathy with her high spirits, and the donkey stopped and turned his head to look solemnly at the laughing girl behind him. "'Come along!' cried the laundress, jerking at the bridle. "'Everyone is passing us upon the road, and we must hurry to get home before noon.' It was true. A good many travellers, some on horseback and some on foot, had passed them by since the sun rose, and although the east gate of the city of Nole was now in sight, they were obliged to take their places in the long line that sought entrance at the gate. 
the five high counsellors of the kingdom of Noland were both eager and anxious upon this important morning. Long before sunrise, Tollybob, the Lord High General, had assembled his army at the east gate of the city, and the soldiers stood in two long lines beside the entrance, looking very impressive in their uniforms, and all the people, noting this unusual display, gathered around at the gate to see what was going to happen. Of course, no one knew what was going to happen, not even the chief counselor nor his brother counselors. They could only obey the law and abide by the results. Finally the sun arose, and the east gate of the city was thrown open. There were a few people waiting outside, and they promptly entered. One, two, three, four, five, six, counted the chief counselor in a loud voice. The people were much surprised at hearing this, and began to question one another with perplexed looks. Even the soldiers were mystified. Seven, eight, nine, continued the chief counselor, still counting those who came in. A breathless hush fell upon the assemblage. Something very important and mysterious was going on. That was evident, but what? They could only wait and find out. Ten, eleven, counted Talidab, and then heaved a deep sigh, for a famous nobleman had just entered the gate, and the chief counselor could not help wishing he had been number forty-seven. So the counting went on, and the people became more and more interested and excited. When the number had reached thirty-one, a strange thing happened. A loud boom sounded through the stillness and then another, and another. Someone was tolling the great bell in the palace bell tower, and people began saying to one another in awed whispers that the old king must be dead. The five counselors, filled with furious anger but absolutely helpless as they could not leave the gate, lifted up their five chubby fists and shook them violently in the direction of the bell tower. Poor Jicky! finding himself left alone in the palace, could no longer resist the temptation to toll the bell, and it continued to peal out its dull, solemn tones, while the chief counselor stood by the gate and shouted, Thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four. Only the mystery of this action could have kept the people quiet when they learned from the bell that their old king was dead. But now they began to guess that the scene at the east gate promised more of interest than anything they might learn at the palace. So they stood very quiet, and Jicky's disobedience of orders did no great harm to the plans of the five high counselors. When Tully Dub had counted up to forty, the excitement redoubled, for everyone could see big drops of perspiration standing upon the chief counselor's brow and all the other high counselors who stood just behind him were trembling violently with nervousness. A ragged, limping peddler entered the gate. Forty-five, shouted Tully Dub. Then came Aunt Rivette, dragging at the bridle of the donkey. Forty-six, screamed Tully Dub. And now Bud rode through the gate perched upon the bundles on the donkey's back and looking composedly upon the throng of anxious faces that greeted him. Forty-seven! cried the chief counselor, and then in his loudest voice he continued, Long live the new king of Noland! All the high counselors prostrated themselves in the dusty road before the donkey. The old woman was thrust back in the crowd by a soldier, where she stood staring in amazement, and Margaret, clothed in her beautiful cloak, stepped to the donkey's side and looked first at her brother and then at the group of periwigged men who bobbed their heads in the dust before him and shouted, Long live the king! Then, while the crowd still wondered, the Lord High Counselor arose and took from a soldier a golden crown set with brilliance, a jewel scepter, and a robe of ermine. Advancing to Bud, he placed the crown upon the boy's head and the scepter in his hand, while over his shoulders he threw the ermine robe. The crown fell over Bud's ears, 
but he pushed it back upon his head so it would stay there. And as the kingly robe spread over all the bundles on the donkey's back and quite covered them, the boy really presented a very imposing appearance. The people quickly rose to the spirit of the occasion. What mattered it if the old king was dead, now that a new king was already before them? They broke into a sudden cheer, and joyously waving their hats and bonnets above their heads, joined eagerly in the cry. Long live the King of Noland! Aunt Rivette was fairly stupefied. Such a thing was too wonderful to be believed. A man in the crowd snatched the bonnet from the old woman's head and said to her brusquely, Why don't you greet the new king? Are you a traitor to your country? So she waved her bonnet and screamed, Long live the king! But she hardly knew what she was doing or why she did it. Meanwhile the high councillors had risen from their knees and now stood around the donkey. "'May it please your serene majesty to condescend to tell us who this young lady is?' asked Tully Dove, bowing respectfully. "'That's my sister Fluff,' said Bud, who was enjoying his new position very much. All the councillors at this bowed low to Margaret. "'A horse for the Princess Fluff!' cried the Lord High General, and the next moment she was mounted upon a handsome white palfrey, where, with her fluffy golden hair and smiling face, and the magnificent cloak flowing from her shoulders, she looked every inch a princess. The people cheered her, too, for it was long since any girl or woman had occupied the palace of the King of Noland, and she was so pretty and sweet that everyone loved her immediately. And now the king's chariot drove up, with its six prancing steeds, and Bud was lifted from the back of the donkey and placed in the high seat of the chariot. Again the people shouted joyful greetings, the band struck up a gay march tune, and then the royal procession started for the palace. First came Tollydob and the officers, then the king's chariot, surrounded by soldiers, then the four high counselors upon black horses, riding two on each side of Princess Fluff, and finally the band of musicians and the remainder of the royal army. It was an imposing sight, and the people followed after with cheers and rejoicings, while the Lord High Purse-Bearer tossed silver coins from his pouch for anyone to catch who could. A message had been sent to warn Jicky that the new king was coming. So he stopped tolling the death knell, and instead rang out a glorious chime of welcome. As for old Rivette, finding herself and the donkey alike deserted, she once more seized the bridle and led the patient beast to her humble dwelling, and it was just as she reached her door that King Bud of Noland, amid the cheers and shouts of thousands, entered, for the first time, the royal palace of Nole. Now, when the new king had entered the palace with his sister, the chief counselor stood upon a golden balcony with a great book in his hand, and read aloud to all the people who were gathered below the law in regard to choosing a new king, and the severe penalty in case any refused to obey his slightest wish. And the people were glad enough to have a change of rulers, and pleased that so young a king had been given them. So they accepted both the law and the new king cheerfully, and soon dispersed to their homes to talk over the wonderful events of the day. Bud and Meg were ushered into beautifully furnished rooms on the second floor of the palace, and old Jiki, finding that he had a new master to serve, flew about in his usual nervous manner, and brought the children the most delicious breakfast they had ever eaten in their lives. Bud had been so surprised at his reception at the gate and the sudden change in his condition that as yet he had not been able to collect his thoughts. His principal idea was that he was in a dream, and he kept waiting until he should wake up. But the breakfast was very real and entirely satisfying, and he began to wonder if he could be dreaming after all. The old servant, when he carried away the dishes, bowed low to Bud and said, Beg pardon, your majesty, 
but the Lord High Counselor desires to know the King's will. Bud stared at him a moment thoughtfully. Tell him I want to be left alone to talk with my sister Fluff, he replied. Jicky again bowed low and withdrew, closing the door behind him, and then the children looked at each other solemnly until Meg burst into a merry laugh. Oh, Bud, she cried, think of it. I'm the royal Princess Fluff, and you're the king of all Noland. Isn't it funny? And then she danced about the room in great delight. Bud answered her seriously. What does it all mean, Fluff? he said. We're only poor children, you know, so I can't really be a king. And I wouldn't be surprised if Aunt Rivette came in any minute and boxed my ears. <laughs> Nonsense, laughed Margaret. Didn't you hear what that fat, periwigged man said about the law? The old king is dead, and someone else had to be king, you know, and the forty-seventh person who entered the East Gate was you, bud. And so by law you are the king of all this great country, don't you see? Bud shook his head and looked at his sister. No, I don't see, he said. But if you say it's all right, Fluff, why, it must be all right. Of course it's all right, declared the girl, throwing off her pretty cloak and placing it on a chair. You're the rightful king, and can do whatever you please, and I'm the rightful princess because I'm your sister, so I can do whatever I please. Don't you see, Bud?" "'But look here, Fluff,' returned her brother. "'If you're a princess, why do you wear that old gray dress and those patched-up shoes? Father used to tell us that princesses always wore the loveliest dresses.' Meg looked at herself and sighed. Ah, "'I really ought to have some new dresses, Bud. And I suppose if you order them they will be ready in no time. And you must have some new clothes, too, for your jacket is ragged and soiled. Do you really think it's true, Fluff? he asked anxiously. Of course it's true. Look at your kingly robe and your golden crown and that stick with all those jewels in it, meaning the scepter. They're true enough, aren't they? Bud nodded. Call in that old man, he said. I'll order something and see if he obeys me. If he does, then I'll believe I'm really a king." "'But now listen, Bud,' said Meg gravely. "'Don't you let these folks see you're afraid, or that you're not sure whether you're a king or not. Order them around and make them afraid of you. That's what the kings do in all the stories I ever read.' "'I will,' replied Bud. "'I'll order them around. So you call in that old donkey with the silver buttons all over him. Here's a bell rope, said Meg. I'll pull it. Instantly Jicky entered and bowed low to each of the children. What's your name? asked Bud. Jicky, your gracious majesty. Who are you? Your majesty's valet, if you please, answered Jicky. Oh, said Bud. He didn't know what a valet was, but he wasn't going to tell Jicky so. I want some new clothes, and so does my sister," Bud announced as boldly as possible. "'Certainly, Your Majesty. I'll send the Lord High Steward here at once." With this he bowed and rushed away, and presently Tallydab, the Lord High Steward, entered the room and with a low bow presented himself respectfully before the children. "'I beg Your Majesty to command me said Tallydab gravely. Bud was a little awed by his appearance, but he resolved to be brave. We want some new clothes, he said. They are already ordered, Your Majesty, and will be here presently. Oh, said Bud, and stopped short. I have ordered twenty suits for Your Majesty and forty gowns for the princess, continued Tallydab. And I hope these will content your majesty and the princess until you have time to select a larger assortment." "'Oh!' said Bud, greatly amazed. 
I have also selected seven maidens, the most noble in all the land, to wait upon the princess. They are even now awaiting her highness in her own apartments. Meg clapped her hands delightedly. I'll go to them at once, she cried. Has your majesty any further commands? asked Tallydab. If not, your five high counselors would like to confer with you in regard to your new duties and responsibilities. Send them in, said Bud promptly. And while Margaret went to meet her new maids, the king held his first conference with his high counselors. In answer to Tallydab's summons, the other four periwigs, pompous and solemn, filed into the room and stood in a row before Bud, who looked upon them with a sensation of awe. "'Your Majesty,' began the venerable Tullydub, in a grave voice, "'we are here to instruct you, with your gracious consent, in your new and important duties.' Bud shifted uneasily in his chair. It all seemed so unreal and absurd, this kingly title and polite deference bestowed upon a poor boy by five dignified and periwigged men, that it was hard for Bud to curb his suspicion that all was not right. "'See here, all of you,' said he suddenly. "'Is this thing a joke? Tell me, is it a joke?' "'A joke?' echoed all of the five counselors in several degrees of shocked and horrified tones, and Tellydeb, the Lord High Executioner, added reproachfully, "'Could we, by any chance, have the temerity to joke with your mighty and glorious majesty?' "'That's just it,' answered the boy. "'I am not a mighty and glorious majesty. I'm just Bud, the ferryman's son, and you know it. "'You are Bud, the ferryman's son, to be sure,' agreed the chief counselor, bowing courteously. "'But by the decrees of fate, and the just and unalterable laws of the land, you are now become absolute ruler of the great kingdom of no land. Therefore all that dwell therein are your loyal and obedient servants.' Bud thought this over. "'Are you sure there's no mistake?' he asked with hesitation. "'There can be no mistake,' returned old Tullydub firmly. "'For we, the five high counselors of the kingdom, have ourselves interpreted and carried out the laws of the land, and the people, your subjects, have approved our action.' "'Then,' said Bud, "'I suppose I'll have to be king whether I want to or not.' "'Your Majesty speaks but the truth,' returned the chief counselor with a sigh. "'With or without your consent, you are the king. It is the law.' And all the others chanted in a chorus, "'It is the law.' Bud felt much relieved. He had no notion whatever of refusing to be a king. If there was no mistake, and he was really the powerful monarch of no land, then there ought to be no end of fun and freedom for him during the rest of his life. To be his own master, to have plenty of money, to live in a palace and order people around as he pleased, all this seemed to the poor and friendless boy of yesterday to be quite the most delightful fate that could possibly overtake one. So lost did he become in thoughts of the marvelous existence opening before him, that he paid scant attention to the droning speeches of the five aged counselors who were endeavoring to acquaint him with the condition of affairs in his new kingdom, and to instruct him in as many and difficult duties as the future ruler. For a full hour he sat quiet and motionless, and they thought he was listening to these dreary affairs of state. But suddenly he jumped up and astonished the dignitaries by exclaiming, "'See here, you just fix things up to suit yourselves. I'm going to find Fluff.' And with no heed to protests, the new king ran from the room and slammed the door behind him. The next day the funeral of the old king took place, 
and the new king rode in the grand procession in a fine chariot clothed in black velvet embroidered with silver. Not knowing how to act in his new position, Bud sat still and did nothing at all, which was just what was expected of him. But when they returned from the funeral he was ushered into the great throne room of the palace and seated on the golden throne, and then the chief counselor informed him that he must listen to the grievances of his people and receive the homage of the noblemen of Noland. Fluff sat on a stool beside the king, and the five high counselors stood back of him in a circle, and then the doors were thrown open, and all the noblemen of the country crowded in. One by one they kissed first the king's hand, and then the princess's hand, and vowed they would always serve them faithfully. Bud did not like this ceremony. He whispered to Fluff that it made him tired. "'I want to go upstairs and play.' he said to the Lord High Steward. I don't see why I can't. Very soon your Majesty may go. Just now it is your duty to hear the grievances of your people, answered Tallydab gently. What's the matter with them? asked Bud crossly. Why don't they keep out of trouble? I do not know, your Majesty, but there are always disputes among the people. But that isn't the King's fault, is it? said Bud. No, your majesty, but it is the king's place to settle these disputes, for he has the supreme power. Well, tell him to hurry up and get it over with, said the boy restlessly. Then a venerable old man came in leading a boy by the arm and holding a switch in his other hand. Your majesty, began the man, having first humbly bowed to the floor before the king, my son, whom I have brought here with me, insists upon running away from home, and I wish you would tell me what to do with him. Why do you run away? Bud asked the boy. Because he whips me, was the answer. Bud turned to the man. Why do you whip the boy? he inquired. Because he runs away, said the man. For a minute Bud looked puzzled. "'Well, if anyone whipped me, I'd run away, too,' he said at last. "'And if the boy isn't whipped or abused, he ought to stay at home and be good. But it's none of my business, anyhow.' "'Oh, your majesty,' said the chief counselor, "'it really must be your business. You're the king, you know, and everybody's business is the king's.' "'That isn't fair,' said Bud sulkily. I've got my own business to attend to, and I want to go upstairs and play." But now Princess Fluff leaned toward the young king and whispered something in his ear which made his face brighten. "'See here!' exclaimed Bud. "'The first time this man whips the boy again, or the first time the boy runs away, I order my Lord High Executioner to give them both a good switching. Now let them go home and try to behave themselves." Everyone applauded his decision, and Bud also thought with satisfaction that he had hit upon a good way out of the difficulty. Next came two old women, one very fat and the other very thin, and between them they led a cow, the fat woman having a rope around one horn and the thin woman a rope around the other. Each woman claimed she owned the cow, and they quarreled so loudly and so long that the Lord High Executioner had to tie a bandage over their mouths. When peace was thus restored, the High Counselor said, Now, Your Majesty, please decide which of these two women owns the cow. I can't, said Bud helplessly. Oh, Your Majesty, but you must cried all the five high counselors. Then Meg whispered to the king again, and the boy nodded. The children had always lived in a little village where there were plenty of cows, and the girl thought she knew a way to decide which of the claimants owned this animal. "'Send one of the women away,' said Bud. So they led the lean woman to a little room nearby and locked her in. "'Bring a pail and a milking-stool,' ordered the king. When they were brought, Bud turned to the fat woman and ordered the bandage taken from her mouth. 
the cow's mine it's my cow i own it she screamed the moment she could speak hold said the king if the cow belongs to you let me see you milk her certainly your majesty certainly she cried and seizing the pail and the stool she ran up to the left side of the cow placed a stool and sat down upon it but before she could touch the cow the animal suddenly gave a wild kick that sent the startled woman in a heap across the floor with her head stuck fast in the milk pail then the cow moved forward a few steps and looked blandly around two of the guards picked the woman up and pulled the pail from her head what's the matter asked bud she's frightened of course whimpered the woman and i'll be black and blue by tomorrow morning your majesty any cow would kick in such a place as this put this woman in the room and fetch the other woman here commanded the king so the lean woman was brought out in order to milk the cow she took the stool in one hand and the pail in the other and approaching the cow softly on the right side patted the animal gently and said to it so boss so bossy my darling good bossy nice bossy the cow turned her head to look at the lean woman and made no objection when she sat down and began milking in a moment the king said the cow is yours take her and go home then all the courtiers and people and even the five high counselors applauded the king enthusiastically and the chief counselor lifted up his hands and said another solomon has come to rule us and the people applauded again till bud looked very proud and quite red in the face with satisfaction tell me he said to the woman who was about to lead the cow away tell me where did you get such a nice faithful bossy as that must i tell the truth asked the woman of course said bud then your majesty she returned i stole her from that fat woman you have locked up in that room but no one can take the cow from me now for the king has given her to me at this a sudden hush fell on the room and bud looked redder than ever then how did it happen that you could milk the cow when she couldn't demanded the king angrily why she doesn't understand cows and i do answered the woman a good day your majesty much obliged i'm sure and she walked away with the cow leaving the king and princess fluff and all the people much embarrassed have we any cows in the royal stables asked bud turning to tully dub certainly your majesty there are several answered the chief counselor then said bud give one of them to the fat woman and send her home i've done all the judging i am going to do today and now i'll take my sister upstairs to play hold on hold on called a shrill voice i demand justice justice of the king justice of the law justice to the king's aunt bud looked down the room and saw aunt rivette struggling with some of the guards then she broke away from them and rushed to the throne crying again justice your majesty what's the matter with you asked bud matter everything's a matter with me aren't you the new king yes said bud that's what i am am i not your aunt am i not your aunt yes said bud again well why am i left to live in a hut and dress in rags doesn't the law say that every blood relation of the king shall live in a royal palace does it asked bud turning to tully dub the law says so your majesty and must i have that old cross patch around me all the time wailed the new king cross patch yourself screamed aunt rivette shaking her fist at bud i'll teach you to cross patch me when i get you alone bud shuddered then he turned again to tully dub the king can do what he likes can't he the boy asked certainly your majesty then let the lord high executioner step forward oh bud what are you going to do said fluff seizing him tightly by the arm you let me alone answered bud i'm not going to be a king for nothing 
and Aunt Rivette whipped me once sixteen hard switches. I counted them. The executioner was now bowing before him. Get a switch, commanded the king. The executioner brought a long, slender birch bow. Now, said Bud, you give Aunt Rivette sixteen good switches. Oh, don't, don't, Bud, pleaded Meg. Aunt Rivette fell on her knees, pale and trembling. In agony she raised her hands. I'll never do it again. Let me off, Your Majesty, she screamed. Let me off this once. I'll never do it again. Never, never. All right, said Bud with a cheery smile. I'll let you off this once. But if you don't behave, or if you interfere with me or Fluff, I'll have the Lord High Executioner take charge of you. Just remember, I'm the king, and then we'll get along all right. Now you may go upstairs if you wish and pick out a room on the top story. Fluff and I are going to play. With this he laid his crown carefully on the seat of the throne and threw off his ermine robe. Come on, Fluff. We've had enough business for today, he said, and dragged the laughing princess from the room while Aunt Rivette meekly followed the Lord High Steward up the stairs to a comfortable apartment just underneath the roof. She was very well satisfied at last, and very soon she sent for the Lord High Purse-Bearer and demanded money with which to buy some fine clothes for herself. That was given her willingly, for the law provided for the comfort of every relative of the king, and knowing this, Aunt Rivette fully intended to be the most comfortable woman in the kingdom of Noland. Bud and Meg had plenty to occupy them in looking over and admiring their new possessions. First they went to the princess's rooms, where Fluff ordered her seven maids to spread out all the beautiful gowns she had received, and forty of them made quite an imposing show, I assure you. They were all dainty and sweet and of rich material, suitable for all occasions, and of all colors and shades. Of course there were none with trains, for Margaret, although a princess, was only a little girl. But the gowns were gay with bright ribbons and jeweled buttons and clasps, and each one had its hat and hosiery and slippers to match. After admiring the dresses for a long time, they looked at Bud's new clothes, twenty suits of velvet, brocades, and finely woven cloths. Some had diamonds and precious gems sewn on them for ornaments while others were plain, but the poorest suit there was finer than the boy had ever dreamed of possessing. There were also many articles of apparel to go with these suits, such as shoes with diamond buckles, silken stockings, neck laces and fine linen, and there was a beautiful little sword with a gold scabbard and a jeweled hilt that the little king could wear on state occasions. However, when the children had examined the gowns and suits to their satisfaction, they began looking for other amusement. "'Do you know, Fluff,' said the boy, "'there isn't a single toy or plaything in this whole palace?' "'I suppose the old king didn't care for playthings,' replied Fluff thoughtfully. Just then there was a knock at the door, and Aunt Rivette came hobbling into the room. Her wrinkled old face was full of eagerness and in her hands she clasped the purse of golden coins the Lord High Purse-Bearer had given her. "'See what I've got!' she cried, holding out the purse. "'And I'm going to buy the finest clothes in all the kingdom, and ride in the king's carriage, and have a man to wait upon me, and make Mammy Skib and Mistress Kepleson and all the other neighbors wild with jealousy.' "'I don't care,' said Bud. "'Why, you owe everything to me!' cried Aunt Rivette. If I hadn't brought you to Nolay on the donkey's back, you wouldn't have been the forty-seventh person to enter the gate." "'That's true,' said Meg. But Bud was angry. "'I know it's true,' he said, but look here. You mustn't bother us. Just keep out of our way, please, and let me alone, and then I won't care how many new dresses you buy." "'I'm going to spend every piece of this gold,' she exclaimed clasping the purse with her wrinkled hands. But I don't like to go through the streets in this poor dress. 
Won't you lend me your cloak, Meg, until I get back? Of course I will, returned the girl, and going to the closet, she brought out the magic cloak the fairy had given her and threw it over Aunt Rivette's shoulders, for she was sorry for the old woman, and this was the prettiest cloak she had. So old Rivette feeling very proud and anxious to spend her money, left the palace and walked as fast as her tottering legs would carry her down the street in the direction of the shops. "'I'll buy a yellow silk,' she mumbled to herself half aloud, "'and a white velvet, and a purple brocade, and a sky-blue bonnet with crimson plumes, and won't the neighbors stare then, oh dear!' If I could only walk faster, and the shops are so far, oh, I wish I could fly." Now she was wearing the magic cloak when she expressed this wish, and no sooner had she spoken than two great feathery wings appeared fastened to her shoulders. The old woman stopped short, turned her head and saw the wings, and then she gave a scream and a jump and began waving her arms frantically. The wings flopped at the same time, raising her slowly from the ground, and she began to soar gracefully above the heads of the astonished people who thronged in the streets below. "'Stop! Help! Murder!' shrieked Rivette, kicking her feet in great agitation, and at the same time flopping nervously her new wings. "'Save me, someone! Save me!' "'Why don't you save yourself?' asked a man below. Stop flying if you want to reach the earth again. This struck old Rivette as a sensible suggestion. She was quite a distance in the air by this time, but she tried to hold her wings steady and not flop them, and the result was that she began to float slowly downward. Then, with horror, she saw she was sinking directly upon the branches of a prickly pear tree. So she screamed and began flying again, and the swift movement of her wings sent her high into the air. So great was her terror that she nearly fainted, but she shut her eyes so that she might not see how high up she was, and held her wings rigid and began gracefully to float downward again. By and by she opened her eyes and found one of her sleeves was just missing the sharp point of a lightning rod on the tower of the palace. So she began struggling and flopping anew, and almost before she knew it, Aunt Rivette had descended to the roof of the royal stables. Here she sat down and began to weep and wail, while a great crowd gathered below and watched her. "'Get a ladder! Please get a ladder!' begged old Rivette. If you don't, I shall fall and break my neck." By this time Bud and Fluff had come out to see what caused the excitement, and to their amazement they found their old aunt perched high up on the stable roof, with two great wings growing out from her back. For a moment they could not understand what had happened. Then Margaret cried, "'Oh, Bud, I let her wear the magic cloak. She must have made a wish. "'Help! Help! Get a ladder!' wailed the old woman, catching sight of her nephew and niece. "'Well, you are a bird, Aunt Rivette,' shouted Bud gleefully, for he was in a teasing mood. "'You don't need a ladder. I don't see why you can't fly down the same way you flew up.' And all the people shouted, "'Yes, yes, the king is right. Fly down!' Just then Rivette's feet began to slip on the sloping roof, so she made a wild struggle to save herself, and the result was that she fluttered her wings in just exactly the right way to sink down gradually to the ground. "'You'll be all right as soon as you know how to use your wings,' said Bud with a laugh. "'But where did you get them, anyhow?' "'I don't know,' said Aunt Rivette, much relieved to be on earth again and rather pleased to have attracted so much attention. Are the wings pretty?" "'They are perfectly lovely,' cried Fluff, clapping her hands in glee. "'Why, Aunt Rivette, I do believe you must be the only person in all the world who can fly.' "'But I think you look like an overgrown buzzard,' said Bud. 
Now it happened that all this praise and the wondering looks of the people did a great deal to reconcile Rivette to her new wings. Indeed, she began to feel a certain pride and distinction in them, and, finding she had, through all the excitement, retained her grasp on the purse of gold, she now wrapped the magic cloak around her and walked away to the shops, followed by a crowd of men, women, and children. As for the king and Princess Fluff, they returned to the palace and dressed themselves in some of their prettiest garments, telling Jicky to have two ponies saddled and ready for them to ride upon. "'We really must have some toys,' said Meg, with decision. "'And now that we are rich, there is no reason why we can't buy what we want.' "'That's true,' answered Bud. "'The old king hadn't anything to play with. Poor old man!' I wonder what he did to amuse himself." They mounted their ponies, and, followed by the chief counselor and the Lord High Purse-Bearer in one of the state carriages, and a guard of soldiers for escort, they rode down the street of the city on a pleasure jaunt amid the shouts of the local populace. By and by Bud saw a toy shop in one of the streets, and he and Fluff slipped down from their ponies and went inside to examine the toys. It was a well-stocked shop, and there were rows upon rows of beautiful dolls on the shelves, which attracted Margaret's attention at once. "'Oh, Bud!' she exclaimed. "'I must have one of these dollies.' "'Take your choice,' said her brother, calmly, although his own heart was beating with delight at the sight of all the toys arranged before him. Oh, "'I don't know which to choose,' sighed the little princess looking from one doll to another with longing and indecision. "'Well, take them all,' declared Bud. "'All? What, all these rows of dollies?' she gasped. "'Why not?' asked the king. Then he turned to the men who kept the shop and said, "'Call in that old fellow who carries the money.' When the Lord High Purse-Bearer appeared, Bud said to him, "'Pay the man for all these dolls.' and for this and this and this and this and he began picking out the prettiest toys in all the shop in the most reckless way you can imagine the soldiers loaded the carriage down with meg's dolls and a big cart was filled with bud's toys then the purse bearer paid the bill although he sighed deeply several times while counting out the money but the new king paid no attention to old tilly dib and when the treasures were all secured, the children mounted their ponies and rode joyfully back to the palace, followed in a procession by the carriage filled with dolls and the cart loaded with toys, while Tully Dub and Tilly Dib, being unable to ride in the carriage, trotted along at the rear on foot. Bud had the toys and dolls all carried upstairs into a big room, and then he ordered everybody to keep out while he and Fluff arranged their playthings around the room and upon the tables and chairs, besides littering the floor so that they could hardly find a clear space large enough for some of their romping games. After all, he said to his sister, it's a good thing to be a king. Or even a princess, added Meg, busily dressing and arranging her dolls. They made Jicky bring their dinner to them in the playroom, as Bud called it but neither of the children could spare much time to eat, their treasures being all so new and delightful. Soon after dusk, while Jicky was lighting the candles, the chief counselor came to the door to say that the king must be ready to attend the royal reception in five minutes. "'I won't,' said Bud. "'I just won't.' "'But you must, Your Majesty,' declared old Tully Dub. "'Am I not the king?' demanded Bud, looking up from where he was arranging an army of wooden soldiers. "'Certainly, Your Majesty,' was the reply. "'And isn't the King's will the law?' continued Bud. "'Certainly, Your Majesty.' "'Well, if that is so, just understand that I won't come. Go away and leave me alone.' "'But the people expect Your Majesty to attend the royal reception protested old Tully Dub, greatly astonished. It is the usual custom, you know, and they would be greatly disappointed if your majesty did not appear. 
I don't care, said Bud. You get out of here and let me alone. But, Your Majesty, the king threw a toy cannon at his chief counselor, and the old man ducked to escape it, and then quickly closed the door. Bud, said the princess softly, you were just saying it's great fun to be a king. So it is, he answered promptly. But father used to tell us, continued the girl, trying a red hat on a brown-haired doll, that people in this world always have to pay for any good thing they get. What do you mean? said Bud with surprise. I mean, if you're going to be the king and wear fine clothes and eat lovely dinners and live in a palace and have countless servants and all the playthings you want and your own way in everything and with everybody, then you ought to be willing to pay for all these pleasures. How? But how can I pay for them? demanded Bud, staring at her. By attending the royal receptions and doing all the disagreeable things the king is expected to do, she answered. Bud thought about it for a minute. Then he got up, walked over to his sister, and kissed her. I believe you're right, Fluff, he said with a sigh. I'll go to that reception tonight and take it as I would take a dose of medicine. Of course you will, returned Fluff, looking up at him brightly. And I'll go with you. The dolls can wait till tomorrow. Have Jicky brush your hair, and I'll get my maids to dress me. Old Tullydub was wondering how he might best explain the king's absence to the throng of courtiers gathered to attend the royal reception, when, to his surprise and relief, his majesty entered the room, accompanied by the princess Fluff. The king wore a velvet suit trimmed with gold lace, and at his side wore the beautiful jeweled sword. Meg was dressed in a soft white silken gown, and looked as sweet and fair as a lily. The courtiers and their ladies, who were all wearing their most handsome and becoming apparel, received their little king with great respect, and several of the wealthiest and most noble among them came up to Bud to converse with him. But the king did not know what to say to these great personages, and so the royal reception began to be a very stupid affair. Fluff saw that all the people were standing in stiff rows and looking at one another uneasily, so she went to Bud and whispered to him. "'Is there a band of musicians in the palace?' the king inquired of Tullydeb, who stood near. "'Yes, Your Majesty.' "'Send for them, then,' commanded Bud. Presently the musicians appeared, and the king ordered them to play a waltz. But the chief counselor rushed up and exclaimed, Oh, Your Majesty, this is against all rule and custom. Silence, said Bud angrily. I'll make the rules and customs in this kingdom hereafter. We're going to have a dance. But it's so dreadful, so unconventional, Your Majesty. It's so, what shall I call it? Here, I've had enough of this, declared Bud. You go and stand in that corner with your face to the wall till I tell you to sit down," he added, remembering a time when his father, the ferryman, had inflicted a like punishment upon him. Somewhat to his surprise, Tully Dub at once obeyed the command, and then Bud made his first speech to the people. "'We're going to have a dance,' he said. "'So pitch in and have a good time. If there's anything you want, ask for it. You're all welcome to stay as long as you please and go home when you get ready." This seemed to please the company, for every one applauded the king's speech. Then the musicians began to play, and the people were soon dancing and enjoying themselves greatly. Princess Fluff had a good many partners that evening, but Bud did not care to dance. He preferred to look on, and, after a time, he brought old Tully Dub out of his corner and made the chief counselor promise to be good and not annoy him again. "'But it is my duty to counsel the king,' protested the old man solemnly. "'When I want your advice, I'll ask for it,' said Bud. While Tully Dub stood beside the throne, looking somewhat sulky and disagreeable, the door opened and Aunt Rivette entered the reception room. She was clothed in a handsome gown of bright green velvet, 
trimmed with red and yellow flowers, and the wings stuck out from the folds at her back in a way that was truly wonderful. Aunt Rivette seemed in an amiable mood. She smiled and curtsied to all the people who stopped dancing to stare at her, and she even fluttered her wings once or twice to show that she was proud of being unlike all the others present. Bud had to laugh at her. She looked so funny. And then a mischievous thought came to him, and he commanded old Tullydub to dance with her. "'But I don't dance, Your Majesty!' exclaimed the horrified chief counselor. "'Try it. I'm sure you can dance,' returned Bud. "'If you don't know how, it's time you learned.' So the poor man was forced to place his arm around Aunt Rivette's waist, and to whirl her around in a waltz. The old woman knew as little about dancing as did Tullydub, and they were exceedingly awkward, bumping into every one they came near. Presently Aunt Rivette's feet slipped, and she would have tumbled upon the floor with the chief counselor had she not begun to flutter her wings wildly. So, instead of falling, she rose gradually into the air, carrying Tullydub with her, for they clung to each other in terror, and one screamed, Murder! and the other, Help! in their loudest voices. Bud laughed until the tears stood in his eyes. But Aunt Rivette, after bumping both her own head and that of the chief counselor against the ceiling several times, finally managed to control the action of her wings and to descend to the floor again. As soon as he was released, old Tullydub fled from the room, and Aunt Rivette, vowing she would dance no more, seated herself beside Bud and watched the revel until nearly midnight, when the courtiers and their ladies dispersed to their own homes, declaring that they had never enjoyed a more delightful evening. Next morning Aunt Rivette summoned Jicky to her room and said, "'Take these shoes and clean and polish them, and carry down this tray of breakfast dishes, and send this hat to the milliner to have the feathers curled, and return this cloak to the Princess Fluff with my compliments, and say I am much obliged for the loan of it.' Poor Jicky hardly knew how to manage so many orders. He took the shoes in his left hand, and the tray of dishes he balanced upon the other upraised palm. But the hat and cloak were too many for him. So Aunt Rivette, calling him a stupid idiot, probably because he had no more hands, set the plumed hat upon Jicky's head, and spread the cloak over his shoulders, and ordered him to make haste away. Jicky was glad enough to go, for the fluttering of Aunt Rivette's wings made him nervous. But he had to descend the stairs cautiously, for the hat was tipped nearly over his eyes, and if he stumbled he would be sure to spill the tray of dishes. He reached the first landing of the broad stairs in safety, but at the second landing the hat joggled forward so that he could see nothing at all, and one of the shoes dropped from his hand. "'Dear me,' sighed the old man, "'I wonder what I shall do now.' If I pick up the shoe, I shall drop the dishes, and I can't set down this tray because I'm blinded by this terrible hat. Dear, dear, oh, if I'm to be at the beck and call of that old woman and serve the new king at the same time, I shall have my hands full. My hands, in fact, are full now. I really wish I had half a dozen servants to wait on me. Jicky knew nothing at all about the magic power of the cloak that fell from his shoulders, so his astonishment was profound when someone seized the shoe from his left hand, and someone else removed the tray from his right hand, and still another person snatched the plumed hat from his head. But then he saw, bowing and smirking before him, six young men, who looked as much alike as peas in the same pod, and all of whom wore very neat and handsome liveries of wine color with silver buttons on their coats. Jicky blinked and stared at these people and rubbed his eyes to make sure he was awake. Who are you? he managed to ask. We are your half a dozen servants, sir, answered the young men, speaking all together and bowing again. 
Jicky gasped and raised his hands with sudden amazement as he gazed in wonder upon the row of six smart servants. But what are you doing here? he stammered. We are here to wait upon you, sir, as is our duty, they answered respectfully. Jicky rubbed his left ear, as was his custom when perplexed, and then he thought it all over, and the more he thought, the more perplexed he became. I don't understand, he finally said in a weak voice. You wished for us, and here we are, declared the six, once more bowing low before him. I know, said Jicky, but I've often wished for many other things, and never got a single one of the wishes before. The young men did not attempt to explain this curious fact. They stood in a straight row before their master, as if awaiting his orders. One held the shoe Jicky had dropped, another its mate, still another the plumed hat, and a fourth the tray of dishes. "'You see,' remarked Jicky, shaking his head sadly at the six, "'I'm only a servant myself.' "'You are our master, sir,' announced the young men, their voices blended into one. "'I wish,' said Jicky solemnly, "'you were all back where you came from.' And then he paused to see if his wish also would be fulfilled. But no, the magic cloak conferred the fulfillment of but one wish upon its wearer, and the half a dozen servants remained standing rigidly before him. Jicky arose with a sigh. Oh, "'Come downstairs to my private room,' he said, "'and we'll talk the matter over.' So they descended the grand stairway to the main hall of the Grand Palace, Jicky going first, and his servants following at a respectful distance. Just off the hall Jicky had a pleasant room where he could sit when not employed, and into this he led the six. After all, he considered, it would not be a bad thing to have half a dozen servants. They could save his old legs from many a tiresome errand. But just as they reached the hall a new thought struck him, and he turned suddenly upon his followers. "'See here,' he exclaimed, "'how much wages do you fellows expect?' "'We expect no wages at all, sir,' they answered. "'What? Nothing at all?' Jicky was so startled that he scarcely had strength remaining to stagger into his private room and sink into a chair. "'No wages? Six servants and no wages to pay?' he muttered. "'Why, it's wonderful, marvelous, astounding!' Then he thought to himself, "'I'll try em and see if they'll really work.' And aloud he asked, "'How can I tell you apart one from another?' Each servant raised his right arm and pointed to a silver badge upon his left breast. And then Jicky discovered that they were all numbered from one up to six. "'Ah, very good,' said Jicky. "'Now, number six, take this shoe into the boot room and clean and polish it.' Number six bowed and glided from the room as swiftly and silently as if he were obeying a command of the King of Noland. Number five, continued Jicky, take this tray to the kitchen. Number five obeyed instantly, and Jicky chuckled with delight. Number two, take this to the milliner in Royal Street and have the feathers curled. Number two bowed and departed almost before the words had left Jicky's mouth and then the king's valet regarded the remaining three in some perplexity. "'Half a dozen servants is almost too many,' he thought. "'It will keep me busy to keep them busy. I should have wished for only one, or two at the most.' Just then he remembered something. "'Number four, said he, "'go after number two and tell the milliner that the hat belongs to Madame Rivette, the king's aunt.' And a few moments later, when the remaining two servants, standing upright before him, had begun to make him nervous, Jicky cried out, "'Number three, take this other shoe down to the boot room, and tell number six to clean and polish it also.' This left but one of the six unoccupied, and Jicky was wondering what to do with him when a bell rang. "'That's the king's bell,' said Jicky. "'I am not the king's servant.' 
"'I am here only to wait upon you,' said number one, without moving to answer the bell. "'Then I must go myself,' sighed the valet, and rushed away to obey the king's summons. Scarcely had he disappeared when Tollydob, the Lord High General, entered the room and said in a gruff voice, "'Where is Jicky? Where's that rascal Jicky?' Number one, standing stiffly at one end of the room, made no reply. "'Answer me, you scoundrel!' roared the old general. "'Where's Jicky?' Still, number one stood silent, and this so enraged old Tollydob that he raised his cane and aimed a furious blow at the young man. The cane seemed to pass directly through the fellow, and it struck the wall behind so forcibly that it split into two parts. This amazed Tollydob. He stared a moment at the silent servant, and then turned his back upon him and sat down in Jicky's chair. Here his eyes fell upon the magic cloak which the king's valet had thrown down. Tollydob, attracted by the gorgeous coloring and soft texture of the garment, picked up the cloak and threw it over his shoulders, and then he walked to a mirror and began admiring his reflection. While thus engaged, Jicky returned, and the valet was so startled at seeing the Lord High General that he never noticed the cloak at all. "'His Majesty has asked to see Your Highness,' said Jicky, "'and I was about to go in search of you.' "'I'll go to the King at once,' answered Tollydob, and as he walked away Jicky suddenly noticed that he was wearing the cloak. Oh ho thought the valet. He has gone off with the Princess Fluff's pretty cloak. But when he returns from the King's chamber I'll get it again and send number one to carry it to its rightful owner." When Tollydob, still wearing the magic cloak, had bowed before the King, Bud asked, "'How many men are there in the royal army, General?' Seven thousand seven hundred and seventy-seven, may it please your gracious Majesty,' returned Tollydob that is, without counting myself." "'And do they obey your orders promptly?' inquired Bud, who felt a little doubt on this point. "'Yes, indeed,' answered the general proudly. "'They are terribly afraid of my anger.' "'And yet you're a very small man to command so large an army,' said the king. The Lord High General flushed with shame for, although he was both old and fat, he was so short of stature that he stood but a trifle taller than Bud himself. And, like all short men, he was very sensitive about his height. "'I am a terrible fighter, Your Majesty,' declared Tollydob earnestly, "'and when I am on horseback my small size is little noticed.' Nevertheless, he added with a sigh, it is a good thing to be tall. I wish I were ten feet high." No sooner were the words spoken than Bud gave a cry of astonishment, for the general's head shot suddenly upward until his gorgeous hat struck the ceiling and was jammed down tightly over the startled man's eyes and nose. The room was just ten feet high, and Tollydob was now ten feet tall but for a time the old general could not think what had happened to him, and Bud, observing for the first time that Tollydob wore the magic cloak, began to shriek with laughter at the comical result of the old man's wish. Hearing the king laugh, the general tore the hat from his head and looked at himself in mingled terror and admiration. From being a very small man he had suddenly become a giant and the change was so great that Tollydob might well be amazed. "'What has happened, Your Majesty?' he asked in a trembling voice. "'Why, don't you see? You were wearing my sister's magic cloak,' said Bud, still laughing at the big man's woeful face, "'and it grants to every wearer the fulfillment of one wish.' "'Only one?' inquired poor Tollydob. I'd like to be a little smaller, I confess." "'It can't be helped now,' said Bud. "'You wish to be ten feet tall, and there you are. And there you'll have to stay, Tollydob, whether you like it or not. But I'm very proud of you.' 
You must be the greatest general in all the world, you know." Tollydob brightened up at this, and tried to sit down in a chair, but it crushed to pieces under his weight, so he sighed and remained standing. Then he threw the magic cloak upon the floor, with a little shudder at its fairy powers, and said, "'If I'd only known, I might have become just six feet tall instead of ten. "'Never mind,' said Bud consolingly. "'If we ever have a war, you will strike terror into the ranks of the enemy, and everyone in no land will admire you immensely. Hereafter you will not only be the Lord High General, but the Lord Very High General.' So Tollydob went away to show himself to the chief counselor, and he had to stoop very low to pass through the doorway. When Jicky saw the gigantic man coming out of the king's chamber, he gave a scream and fled in terror, and, strange to say, this effect was very agreeable to the Lord High General, who loved to make people fear him. Bud ran to tell Fluff of the curious thing that had happened to the general, and so it was that when the Lord High Executioner entered the palace there was no one around to receive him. He made his way into the king's chamber, and there he found the magic cloak lying upon the floor. "'I've seen the Princess Fluff wearing this,' thought the Lord High Executioner, "'so it must belong to her. I'll take it to her rooms, for it is far too pretty to be lying around in this careless way, and Jicky ought to be scolded for allowing it.' So Tellydeb picked up the cloak and laid it over his arm. Then he admired the bright hues that ran through the fabric, and presently his curiosity got the better of him, and he decided to try it on and see how he would look in it. While thus employed, the sound of a girl's sweet laughter fell upon Tellydeb's ears, seeming to come from a far distance. "'The princess must be in the royal gardens,' he said to himself. "'I'll go there and find her.' So the Lord High Executioner walked through the great hall, still wearing the cloak, and finally came to the back of the palace and passed a doorway leading into the gardens. All was quiet there, save for the song of the birds as they fluttered among the trees, but at the other end of the garden Tellydeb caught a glimpse of a white gown which he suspected might be that of the little princess. He walked along the path slowly, enjoying the scent of the flowers and the peacefulness of the scene, for the Lord High Executioner was a gentle-natured man and delighted in beautiful sights. After a time he reached a fruit orchard, and saw hanging far up in a big tree a fine red apple. Tullydeb paused and looked at this longingly. Ah, I wish I could reach that apple, he said with a sigh as he extended his arm upward. Instantly the arm stretched toward the apple, which was at least forty feet away from the Lord High Executioner, and, while the astonished man eyed his elongated arm in surprise, the hand clutched the apple, plucked it, and drew it back to him, and there he stood, the apple in his hand, and his arm apparently the same as it had been before he accomplished the wonderful feat. For a moment the counselor was overcome with fear. The cloak dropped unnoticed from his shoulders and fell upon the graveled walk, while Tullydeb sank upon a bench and shivered. It, it was like magic, he murmured. I but reached out my hand so, and it went nearly to the top of the tree, and— Here he gave a cry of wonder, for again his arm stretched the distance and touched the topmost branches of the tree. He drew it back hastily, and turned to see if anyone had observed him. But this part of the garden was deserted, so the old man eagerly tested his new accomplishment. He plucked a rose from a bush a dozen yards to the right, and having smelled its odor, he placed it in a vase that stood twenty feet to his left. Then he noted a fountain far across a hedge, and reaching the distance easily, dipped his hand in the splashing water. It was all very amazing, this sudden power to reach a great distance, and the Lord High Executioner was so pleased with the faculty that when he discovered old Jicky standing in the palace doorway, he laughingly fetched him a box on the ear 
that sent the valet scampering away to his room in amazed terror. Said Tellydeb to himself, Now I'll go home and show my wife what a surprising gift I have acquired. So he left the garden, and not long afterward old Tallydab, the Lord High Steward, came walking down the path, followed by his little dog Ruffles. I am not certain whether it was because his coat was so shaggy, or his temper so uncertain, that Tallydab's dog was named Ruffles, but the name fitted both the looks and the disposition of the tiny animal. Nevertheless the Lord High Steward was very fond of his dog which followed him everywhere except to the king's council chamber. And often the old man would tell Ruffles his troubles and worries, and talk to the dog just as one would to a person. Today, as they came slowly down the garden path, Tallydab noticed a splendid cloak lying upon the path. "'How very beautiful!' he exclaimed, as he stooped to pick it up. I have never seen anything like this since the Princess Fluff first rode into Nole beside her brother the King. Isn't it a lovely cloak, Ruffles?" The dog gave a subdued yelp and wagged his stubby tail. "'How do I look in it, Ruffles?' continued the Lord High Steward, wrapping the folds of the magic cloak about him. "'How do I look in such gorgeous apparel?' The dog stopped wagging his tail and looked up at its master earnestly. "'How do I look?' again asked Tallydab. "'I declare, I wish you could talk.' "'You look perfectly ridiculous,' replied the dog in a rather harsh voice. The Lord High Steward jumped nearly three feet in the air. So startled was he by Ruffles' reply. Then he bent down, a hand on each knee, and regarded the dog curiously. "'I thought at first you had spoken,' said he. "'What caused you to change your mind?' asked Ruffles, peevishly. "'I did speak. I am speaking. Can't you believe it?' The Lord High Steward drew a deep sigh of conviction. "'I believe it,' he made answer. "'I have always declared you were a wonderful dog, and now you prove I am right. Why, you are the only dog I ever heard of who could talk.' "'Except in fairy tales,' said Ruffles calmly. "'Don't forget the fairy tales.' "'I don't forget,' replied Tallydab. "'But this isn't a fairy tale, Ruffles. It's real life in the kingdom of Noland.' "'To be sure,' answered Ruffles. "'But see here, my dear master. Now that I am at last able to talk, please allow me to ask you for something decent to eat.' I'd like a good meal for once, just to see what it is like." "'A good meal?' exclaimed the steward. "'Why, my friend, don't I give you a big bone every day?' "'You do,' said the dog, and I nearly break my teeth on it, trying to crack it to get a little marrow. Whatever induces people to give their dogs bones instead of meat?' "'Why, I thought you liked bones,' protested Tallydab sitting on the bench and looking at his dog in astonishment. "'Well, I don't. I prefer something to eat, something good and wholesome, such as you yourself eat,' growled Ruffles. The Lord High Steward gave a laugh. "'Why,' said he, "'don't you remember that old Mother Hubbard?' "'Ah, that was a fairy tale,' interrupted Ruffles impatiently and there wasn't even a bone in her cupboard after all. Don't mention Mother Hubbard to me if you want to retain my friendship." "'And that reminds me,' resumed the steward with a scowl, "'that a few minutes ago you said I looked ridiculous in this lovely cloak.' "'You do,' said Ruffles with a sniff. "'It's a girl's cloak, and not fit for a wrinkled old man like you.' "'I believe you are right.' answered Tallydab with a sigh, and he removed the cloak from his shoulders and hung it over the back of the garden seat. "'In regard to the meat that you so long for,' he added, "'if you will follow me to the royal kitchen, I will see that you have all you desire.' "'Spoken like a good friend,' exclaimed the dog. "'Let's go at once.' So they passed down the garden to the kitchen door, and the magic cloak, which had wrought such wonderful things that day, 
still remained neglectfully cast aside. It was growing dusk when old Tilly Dib, the Lord High Purse-Bearer, stole into the garden and sat upon the bench to smoke his pipe in peace. All the afternoon he had been worried by people with bills for this thing and that, and the royal purse was very light indeed when Tilly Dib had at last managed to escape to the garden. If this keeps up, he reflected, there will be no money left, and then I am sure I don't know what will become of us all. The air was chilly. The old counselor shivered a little, and noting the cloak that lay over the back of the seat, drew it about his shoulders. It will be five months, he muttered half aloud, before we can tax the people for more money, and before five months are up the king and his counselors may all starve to death, even in this splendid palace. Hey ho I wish the royal purse would always remain full, no matter how much money I drew from it. The big purse, which had laid lightly on his knee, now slid off and pulled heavily upon the golden chain which the old man wore around his neck to fasten the purse to him securely. Aroused from his anxious thoughts, Tilly Dib lifted the purse to his lap again, and was astonished to feel its weight. He opened the clasp and saw that the huge sack was actually running over with gold pieces. "'Now where on earth did all this wealth come from?' he exclaimed, shaking his head in a puzzled way. "'I'll go at once and pay some of the creditors who are waiting for me.' So he ran to the royal treasury, which was a front room in the palace, and began paying every one who presented an account. He expected presently to empty the purse, but no matter how heavily he drew upon the contents, it remained ever as full as in the beginning. It must be, thought the old man when the last bill had been paid, that my idle wish has in some mysterious way been granted. But he did not know he owed his good fortune to the magic cloak which he still wore. As he was leaving the room he met the king and Princess Fluff, who were just come from dinner, and the girl exclaimed, "'Why, there is my cloak. Where did you get it, Tilly Dib?' "'I found it in the garden,' answered the Lord High Purse-Bearer. "'But take it, if it is yours. And here is something to repay you for the loan of it.' And he poured into her hands a heap of glittering gold. "'Oh, thank you,' cried Fluff and, taking the precious cloak, she dropped the gold into it and carried it to her room. "'I'll never lend it again unless it is really necessary,' she said to herself. "'It was very careless of Aunt Rivette to leave my fairy cloak in the garden.' And then, after carefully folding it and wrapping it up, she locked it in a drawer and hid the key where no one but herself could find it. It is not very far from the kingdom of Noland to the kingdom of Ix. If you followed the steps of Quavo the Minstrel, you would climb the sides of a steep mountain range, and go down on the other side and cross a broad and swift river, and pick your way through a dark forest. You would then have reached the land of Ix, and would find an easy path into the big city. But even before one came to the city, he would see the high marble towers of Queen Zixi's magnificent palace, and pause to wonder at its beauty. Quavo the minstrel had been playing his harp in the city of Nole, and his eyes were sharp, so he had seen many things to gossip and sing about, and therefore never doubted he would be warmly welcomed by Queen Zixi. He reached the marble palace about dusk one evening, and was bidden to the feast which was about to be served. A long table ran down the length of the lofty hall built in the center of the palace, and this table was covered with gold and silver platters bearing many kinds of meats and fruits and vegetables, while tall ornamental stands contained sweets and delicacies to tickle the palate. At the head of the table, on a jeweled throne, sat Queen Zixi herself, a vision of radiant beauty and charming grace. Her hair was yellow as spun gold, and her wondrous eyes raven black in hue. Her skin was fair as a lily, save where her cheek was faintly tinted with a flush of rose color. 
dainty and lovely indeed was the queen of Ix in appearance. Yet none of her lords or attendants cast more than a passing glance upon her beauty, for they were used to seeing her thus. There were greybeards at her table this evening, who could remember the queen's rare beauty since they were boys, I and those who had been told by their fathers and grandfathers of Queen Zixi's loveliness when they also were mere children. In fact, no one in Ix had ever heard of the time when the land was not ruled by this same queen, or when she was not in appearance as young and fair as she was today, which easily proves she was not an ordinary person at all. And I may as well tell you here that Queen Zixi, despite the fact that she looked to be no more than sixteen, was in reality six hundred and eighty-three years of age, and had prolonged her life in this extraordinary way by means of the arts of witchcraft. I do not mean by this that she was an evil person. She had always ruled her kingdom wisely and liberally, and the people of Ix made no matter of complaint against their queen. If there were a war, she led her armies in person, clad in golden mail and helmet, and in years of peace she taught them to sow and reap grain, and to fashion many useful articles of metal, and to build strong and substantial houses. Nor were her taxes ever more than the people could bear. Yet, for all this, Zixi was more feared than loved, for everyone remembered she was a witch and also knew she was hundreds of years old. So, no matter how amiable their queen might be, she was always treated with extreme respect, and folks weighed well their words when they conversed with her. Next the queen, on both sides of the table, sat her most favored nobles and their ladies. Further down were the rich merchants and officers of the army, and at the lower end were servants and members of the household, for this was the custom in the land of Ix. Quavo the harpist sat near the lower end, and when all had been comfortably fed, the queen called upon him for a song. This was the moment Quavo had eagerly awaited. He took his harp, seated himself in a niche of the wall, and, according to the manner of ancient minstrels, he sang of the things he had seen in other lands, thus serving his hearers with the news of the day, as well as pleasing them with his music. This is the way he began. Of Noland now a tale I'll sing, where reigns a strangely youthful king, a boy who has by chance alone been called to sit upon a throne. His sister shares his luck, and she, the fairy's friend, is said to be, for they did mystic arts invoke, and weave for her a magic cloak, which grants its wearer, thus I'm told, gifts more precious far than gold. She's but to wish, and her desire quite instantly she will acquire, and when she lends it to her friends, the favor unto them extends. For one who wears the cloak can fly like any eagle in the sky, and one did wish, by sudden freak, his dog be granted power to speak. And now the beast can talk as well as I, and also read and spell. And— Stop! cried the queen with sudden excitement. Do you lie, minstrel, or are you speaking the truth? Secretly glad that his news was received thus eagerly, Quavo continued to twang the harp as he replied in verse, Now may I die at break of day, if false is any word I say. And what is this cloak like, and who owns it? demanded the queen impetuously. Sang the minstrel, The cloak belongs to Princess Fluff, tis woven of some secret stuff, which makes it gleam with splendor bright, that fills beholders with delight. Thereafter the beautiful Zixi remained lost in thought, her dainty chin resting within the hollow of her hand, and her eyes dreamily fixed upon the minstrel. And Quavo, judging that his news had brought him into rare favor, told more and more wonderful tales of the magic cloak, some of which were true, while others were mere inventions of his own, 
for newsmongers, as everyone knows, were ever unable to stick to facts since the world began. All the courtiers and officers and servants listened with wide eyes and parted lips to the song, marveling greatly at what they had heard. And when it was finally ended, and the evening far spent, Queen Zixi threw a golden chain to the minstrel as a reward, and left the hall, attended by her maidens. Throughout the night which followed, she tossed sleeplessly upon her bed, thinking of the magic cloak, and longing to possess it. And when the morning sun rose over the horizon, she made a solemn vow that she would secure the magic cloak within a year, even if it cost her half of her kingdom. Now the reason for this rash vow, showing Zixi's intense desire to possess the cloak, was very peculiar. Although she had been an adept at witchcraft for more than six hundred years, and was able to retain her health and remain in appearance young and beautiful, there was one thing her art was unable to deceive, and that one thing was a mirror. To mortal eyes Zixi was charming and attractive, yet her reflection in a mirror showed her an ugly old hag, bald of head, wrinkled, with toothless gums and withered sunken cheeks. For this reason the queen had no mirror of any sort about the palace. Even from her own dressing-room the mirror had been banished and she depended upon her maids and hairdressers to make her look as lovely as possible. She knew she was beautiful in appearance to others. Her maids declared it continually, and in all eyes she truly read admiration. But Zixi wanted to admire herself, and that was impossible, so long as the cold mirrors showed her reflection to be the old hag others would also have seen had not her arts of witchcraft deceived them. Everything else a woman and a queen might desire Zixi was able to obtain by her arts, yet the one thing she could not have made her very unhappy. As I have already said, she was not a bad queen. She used her knowledge of sorcery to please her own fancy or to benefit her kingdom, but never to injure anyone else. So she may be forgiven for wanting to see a beautiful girl reflected in a mirror instead of a haggard old woman in her six hundred and eighty-fourth year. Zixi had given up all hope of ever accomplishing her object until she heard of the magic cloak. The powers of witches are somewhat limited, but she knew that the powers of fairies are boundless. So if the magic cloak could grant any human wish, as Quavo's song had told her was the case, she would manage to secure it, and would at once wish for a reflection in the mirror of the same features all others beheld, and then she would become happy and content. Now, as might be expected, Queen Zixi lost no time in endeavoring to secure the magic cloak. The people of Ix were not on friendly terms with the people of Noland, so she could not visit Princess Fluff openly, and she knew it was useless to try to borrow so priceless a treasure as a cloak which had been the gift of the fairies. But one way remained to her to steal the precious robe. So she began her preparations by telling her people she would be absent from Ix for a month, and then she retired to her own room and mixed, by the rules of witchcraft, a black mess in a silver kettle, and boiled it until it was as thick as molasses. Of this inky mixture she swallowed two teaspoonfuls every hour for six hours, muttering an incantation each time. At the end of the six hours her golden hair had become brown, and her black eyes had become blue. And this was quite sufficient to disguise the pretty queen so that no one would recognize her. Then she took off her richly embroidered queenly robes and hung them up in a closet, putting on a simple gingham dress, a white apron, and a plain hat such as common people of her country wore. 
When these preparations had been made, Zixi slipped out the back door of the palace and walked through the city to the forest, and although she met many people, no one suspected that she was the queen. It was rough walking in the forest, but she got through at last and reached the bank of the river. Here a fisherman was found who consented to ferry her across in his boat, and afterward Zixi climbed the high mountains and came down the other side into the kingdom of Noland. She rented a neat little cottage just at the north gateway of the city of Nole, and by the next morning there was a sign over the doorway which announced, Miss Trust's Academy of Witchery for Young Ladies. Then Zixi had printed on green paper a lot of handbills which read as follows. Miss Trust, a pupil of the celebrated Professor Hatrack of Hooktown on the Creek, is now located at Woodbine Villa, North Gateway of Nole, and is prepared to teach the young ladies of this city the arts of witchcraft according to the most modern and approved methods. Terms moderate. References required. These handbills she hired a little boy to carry to all the aristocratic houses in Nole, and to leave one on each doorstep. Several were left on the different doorsteps of the palace, and one of these came to the notice of Princess Fluff. "'How funny!' she exclaimed on reading it. "'I'll go and take all my eight maids with me. It will be no end of fun to learn to be a witch.' Many other people in Nole applied for instruction in Miss Trust's academy, but Zixi told them all she had no vacancies. When, however, Fluff and her maids arrived, she welcomed them with the utmost cordiality, and consented to give them their first lesson at once. When she had seated them in her parlor, Zixi said, if you wish to be a witch, you must speak an incantation. You must with deliberation say, The win of why is witch. What does that mean? asked Fluff. No one knows, answered Zixi, and therefore it is a fine incantation. Now all the class will please repeat after me the following words. A rigmarole, a rigmarole. Jiggernut, joggernut, cue jiggery. Simmerkin, samarkin, simmer garoo. Zilly pop, zilly pop, lolly pop loo. They tried to do this, but their tongues stumbled constantly over the syllables, and one of the maids began to laugh. Stop laughing, please, cried Zixi, rapping her ruler on the table. This is no laughing matter, I assure you, young ladies. The science of witchcraft is a solemn and serious study, and I cannot teach it to you unless you behave." "'But what's it all about?' asked Fluff. "'I'll explain what it's about tomorrow," said Zixi with dignity. "'Now here are two important incantations which you must learn by heart before you come to tomorrow's lesson. If you can speak them correctly and rapidly, and above all very distinctly, I will then allow you to perform a wonderful witchery." She handed them each a slip of paper on which were written the incantations as follows. Incantation number one, to be spoken only in the presence of a black cat. This is that, and that is this. Bliss is blessed, and blessed is bliss. Who is that, and what is who? Shed is shod, and shud is shoe. Incantation number two, to be spoken when the clock strikes twelve. What is which, and which is what? Pat is pet, and pit is pat. Hid is hide, and hod is hid. Did is deed, and done is did. Now there is one thing more, continues Zixi, and this is very important. You must each wear the handsomest and most splendid cloak you can secure when you come to me tomorrow morning. This request made Princess Fluff thoughtful all the way home, for she at once remembered her magic cloak, 
and wondered if the strange mistrust knew she possessed it. She asked Bud about it that night, and the young king said, "'I'm afraid this witch-woman is someone trying to get hold of your magic cloak. I would advise you not to wear it when she is around, or, more than likely, she may steal it.' So Fluff did not wear her magic cloak the next day, but selected in its place a pretty blue cape edged with gold. When she and her maids reached the cottage, Zixi cried out angrily, "'That is not your handsomest cloak. Go home at once and get the other.' "'I won't,' said Fluff shortly. "'You must, you must,' insisted the witch-woman. "'I can teach you nothing unless you wear the other cloak.' "'How did you know I had another cloak?' asked the princess suspiciously. "'By witchcraft, perhaps,' said Zixi mildly. "'If you want to be a witch, you must wear it.' "'I don't want to be a witch,' declared Fluff. "'Come, girls, come, let's go home at once.' "'Wait, wait,' implored Zixi eagerly. "'If you'll get the cloak, I will teach you the most wonderful things in the world. I will make you the most powerful witch that ever lived.' "'I don't believe you,' replied Fluff. And then she marched back to the palace with all her maids. But Zixi knew her plot had failed. So she locked up the cottage and went back again to Ix, climbing the mountain and crossing the river, and threading the forest with angry thoughts and harsh words. Yet the queen was more determined than ever to secure the magic cloak. As soon as she had re-entered her palace, and by more incantations had again transformed her hair to yellow and her eyes to black, and dressed herself in her royal robes, she summoned her generals and counselors and told them to make ready to war upon the kingdom of Noland.